And now that we have looked at the pack test, which is the most restrictive of all tests, um, it makes a very restrict, a very restrictive assumptions. Um, we we have looked at the glacier, which is more flexible, um, because it allows for several functional specifications. Um, we now move on to the Godfield quant test. Now, what you will see is that in spirit, these tests are all trying to test the same thing, which is, is the variance of the error term constant or not? So, so, so that's the hypothesis we are testing. The null that we are testing is variance of the error term is constant. The alternative is it is heterostatic, that is, it is non-constant. Uh, but the, the test procedure is what is differing here. The test make different assumptions. So now, uh, Godford, Godford and Quant uh, proceed by making an assumption. Notice, they make an assumption that the heterosidastic variance, which we can't observe because it's a population feature, notice that it doesn't have a head there, the heterosidastic variance is proportional to the square of our x variable, which is education in this case. This, of course, is constant. As you can see, this is the homocidastic variance which is always constant anyway okay so essentially the relationship here is between the heterostatic variance and the x variable which is education in this case now so what pack does what what g and q do is they observe that if for example someone were to collect data on earnings here at Rhodes, they just say, okay, let me collect data on, on earnings from the academic staff at Rhodes. Okay. You know that our academic staff starts with junior lecturers, those who only have honors and are studying towards their masters. It is those who only, who only have masters. It is those who have PhDs, it is associate professors, it is professors, okay? Five, these are five, five tiers in the hierarchy, right? Now, <clears throat> if the person collecting the data on earnings is very naive in the way they do this, they just say, oh, this is the academic stuff, I collect data, and then you just run your regression and you use your pack or your glacier. The problem you are most likely going to encounter is you will see that the, the salary scale or the, the, the earnings actually change as the level of qualification changes. Okay, so professors earn a lot more than a junior lecturer, than an associate lecturer, than a senior lecturer, than, you know, in, in that order, right? But also, so, so as you move upwards, if you were to plot your earnings against the qualification levels, you see that there will be several islands of clusters of earnings. And these islands of clusters are suggesting to you that the data generating process underlying the earnings you observe is different for each of these five tiers. But now the problem is you have treated them as just a single, um, just as being uh, determined by the same data generating process. As a result of that, you will find that the variance of the error term will be non-constant. But for you to be able to do that clearly, 
Goldford and Quant argue that you need to subdivide the symbol into a sub-symbol of lower earnings, um, uh, lower levels of education, and a sub-symbol of very high levels of education. Once you have done that, you estimate a sub-regression for the one and you estimate a sub-regression for the other. You compare their residual sum of squares adjusted for degrees of freedom. The chi-squared, I mean the, the, the test statistic you generate, which is lambda there, will follow an F distribution with numerator degrees of freedom and denominator degrees of freedom. And then you carry out your hypothesis test procedure using the F test. If you find that the F observed exceeds the F critical, you have reason to reject the homocidastic claim in the now hypothesis. Why? Because if it is significant, you're actually saying that the two subsymbols are essentially very different. You see that? which means the earnings behavior in the sample with larger levels or higher levels of education is quite different from the one with lower levels of education. And there are residual sum of squares, remembering that we actually estimate our variance again also using your, your, your residual sum of squares anyway, okay? All right, so, so what is happening here, you are actually taking, if, if we were to, to, to take this uh, further, yeah, just to, to, to clarify thoughts here, um, what we are actually doing here is the same thing as saying, I hope this will not waste time, just to help someone understand, so this is variance. <coughs> Of so this is your variance of error term in high level of education symbol and and this one is variance. of error term in low level of education symbol. Essentially, this is what uh, Gujarat is trying to explain. Um, that's what he's trying to explain. So you're actually taking a ratio of the variances. That's what you're doing there. All right, so then Park says, I mean, Glaser, Goldford, and Quant. Sure, I'm confusing these names. Goldford and Quant say that's what you have to do. But for you to be able to do that, you have to, to divide the symbol by omitting the central observation such, such that the the values to the values above the omitted section, the, the, the sub symbol above the omitted section is equal to the sub symbol below the omitted uh, subsection. So you have to determine some central number of observations that must be taken out of the symbol. This is done to magnify the difference between the two sub-symbols so that the variances are quite uh, distinct if they, if they ever turn out to be. All right, so what we're we going to do <coughs> in line with, we are going to sort our data in ascending order of the explanatory variable, okay? So let me just highlight everything here. I use the sort function, custom sort. I want to sort this by education from small, smallest to largest, okay? 
So it has sorted the data. You can see 4 is the smallest, the largest is 18. So it has sorted everything for me. Now, once I've done that, because this is the this this symbol is 50, that is the symbol size is 50. So if we were to omit the C central observations, it would mean that the one sub symbol will have 20, the other sub symbol will have 20, and we omit 10 central observations. Okay. So let me take the first 20 observations, these ones. Let me put them there. Uh, let me copy that, put it here. Okay. Um, these are the... Mm -mm -mm -mm. All right, so now if... If this is the 20th observation, so these are the C central observations, the 10 that we must take out from the sample. So I'm going to take from row 32 to the end, which you can see is also 20 observations. So I bring that here. You can see that this, the samples are equal. Let's call this one earnings one. This is the symbol of lower levels of education. Let's call this two. Let's call this two. Okay. So what I've done is our N is now 20 here, our N is now 20. Although the original N was 50, I have omitted um rows uh, from 22 to 31 uh, 31 so i've omitted these 10 observations so what i've done is i've taken out these rows and deleted them okay and so i'm left with this symbol above it and this symbol below it okay so what what godford and Quant says that you must estimate these and generate um, residual sum of squares from each of these regressions, then adjust them for their degrees of freedom. So the degrees of freedom are now, as you know, are n minus k, um, that's n i, n1 minus k, and n2 minus k. Okay. okay, now 20 minus 2, 20 minus 2, so it's 18, 18. All right, let's proceed and do now the Glaser test. Regress. Our dependent variable is earnings 1 in this case and education one and we want residuals then we say okay um we can take these residuals actually what we want is the squared so let's square them residuals one squared so this is equal to that number squared. Okay, let's remove the formula because we want to move this stuff to another sheet. What happened? All right. Copy that. I'll bring it here. Then we estimate the other one, regress, our dependent is earnings 2, and our explanatory is education 2, we want residuals, okay, 
what we want is residuals 2 squared now which is that squared but we actually want to kill the formulas there we copy this bring it to our sheet or paste now what we actually want is the sum of the residuals so let's just use the auto sum function here to save ourselves time um, where is the other one the other one is this one auto sum okay so these are the two let me now the degrees of freedom df is 18 is 18 okay now we are going to find our f orbs which is called lambda in that slide here this is the f orbs is lambda here um, which is equal to the variance of this is the symbol with high levels of education. This is the symbol with lower levels of education. So it is actually equal to all right, equal to this divided by its degrees of freedom over that divided by its degrees of freedom. And you get 0 0.981, which is what you see in your slides here, 982. Okay. Right. Here I didn't put degrees of freedom. Essentially they eliminate each other because they are the same. So 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 essentially if you divide that that by that, you get this because the the, the the degrees of freedom is the same number, so it eliminates, uh, they, el they eliminate each other. All right, from there, our F critical, you would have stated your, your usual decision uh, making uh, process here. The now says the error variance is constant, the alternative says it is not. Then you find your F critical. Uh, let's just check. The, the F tables. Um, numerator degrees of freedom is 18. We don't have 18. We jump from 15 to 20. But we do have 18 here. So, and we are doing that at 5%. So we are in this row. We are going to use 20 because it's closer to 18 for the numerator degrees of freedom. So we have 2.19. I think in my, in the other one, I used the 20, 20, I think, because I think I have 2.12. Okay, so it should be 2.19. Your F critical is equal to 2.19, okay? So now your decision criteria says, if the F observed, that is, if this lambda is bigger than the F critical, which is 2.19, we must reject the null hypothesis. Otherwise, we should fail to do it. Now, if you look at 0 0.98, it is much smaller than the critical value. So, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. But what is the null hypothesis saying? Error variance is constant. So, we come to the same conclusion as the Park and as the Glacier test. Do you see that? That's the that's Glacier test. The, the, the long and short of this test is that you must order your data in ascending order, omit some C central observations so that you have two equal subsamples, estimate two subregressions, generate estimated residuals from each, 
um, square them and take the ratio of the variances of the error term of the respective sub regressions with the numerator being the, the error variance of the sample with the larger values. And that test statistic follows an F distribution with the numerator denominator degrees of freedom being equal and at some level of significance. And so the usual test procedure follows. Okay, I will stop here.